these ideas of metabolism and mental health being connected, they're not new. They've been uh, around for 100 years. Uh, 100 years ago in psychiatry, we had uh, seen that there were levels of lactate that were elevated in serious mental illness and that there were uh, levels of glutathione, uh, which were low. Uh, they were low and it is an antioxidant. Uh, and so these markers were markers of bioenergetic dysfunction. And so the lactate is like when you exercise too much and your calves hurt because you're you've got lactic acid in your muscles. That's happening in your brain. And so there's also a preferential area of energy production towards glycolysis um, that produces lactate, and that tends to be more common in certain diseases. Um, so we see that in neurodegenerative conditions. We see that in serious mental illness like bipolar uh, disorder and schizophrenia and major depression. Um, so when I say serious mental illness, I'm talking about these three illnesses primarily. Yeah. Knowing that these were biomarkers that we saw 100 years ago, and then we went in different directions over the last 100 years, focused on neurotransmitters and you know other systems, which are only just part of the picture. There's a much bigger picture when we think about metabolism. So uh, metabolism is really just thinking about food, breakdown into energy, and everything that happens in between is detail. Metabolic psychiatry is thinking about that metabolism and mental health connection, but it's the study of all of the metabolic dysfunctions, both systemic as well as central. So you can have dysfunction in the brain and you can have dysfunction outside the brain, in the body, where they're connected, right? And those two elements are important in thinking about how that affects psychiatric disease and mental health. And so when we look at how that dysfunction affects psychiatric symptoms, whether it's prevention, whether it's progression of disease or treatment of disease, that's really what metabolic psychiatry is about. I think other instances, metabolic psychiatry has been defined as brain energy metabolism only, or it's been defined as uh, just the ketogenic diet, for example. Mm. And I want to clear that up because metabolic psychiatry really is a more holistic term that incorporates all systemic as well as central metabolic dysfunction and how that affects psychiatric disease. Yeah, so so just for people listening in medicine, we talk about metabolism and people say I have a slow metabolism in the lay culture or you know, I have fast metabolism. They mean a little bit different things. So metabolism is, yes, how you eat food and it converts into energy, but there's an enormous number of metabolic pathways. If you were to put on a wall in basically microprint, it would be a giant wall, a all the metabolic pathways, yeah. you know, these set of things we see in medical school. And every single one of those pathways are part of the biochemical reactions that happen across every system in your body. And there's 37 billion trillion chemical reactions every second in your body. All those are part of the me your metabolic system. And all those things, I think, affect our, our mental health and every everything else in terms of our disease. So understanding that is really important, and it's kind of a neglected thing in medicine. We sort of give lip service to it in the first year of medical school. We pretty much ignore it after that. We don't learn much about things like insulin resistance, uh, but even less about nutrition, which is driving a lot of the metabolic systems, right? Because every one of those biochemical pathways requires a nutrient to actually work. So in a mm -hmm. sense, metabolic psychiatry, you're saying, is is the bigger rubric that encompasses all of that, not just sugar and glucose and metabolism from that perspective, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, I think that's important to understand. And those metabolic pathways affect everything. So it's very complicated. We kind of like look at that chart and maybe learn a little bit about it, but it's it's kind of not this thing that we pay attention to. But it ends up being the kind of, I would say, holy grail of how to actually think about health in general and particularly psychiatry. And and the fact that you've you sort of are pointing to the fact that the way we thought about mental illness might not be totally accurate. And and I think this is part of the problem in our society is that you know, if someone has uh, rheumatoid arthritis, their joints are damaged, we don't say, oh, there's something wrong with you. Like, we go, oh, too bad. I'm sorry you're suffering from this. It's like, <laughs> how can I help? With mental health, there's a lot of stigma around it, and there's a lot of judgment around it, and there's a lot of attribution of meaning to it. And I think through history, there's been this, this phenomena of different views of mental illness throughout history. And I think we're in this new era of, of, of understanding mental illness through the lens of metabolic psychiatry and also, I don't know what you call it, trauma-informed psychiatry or, you know, 
psychedelic medicine, which is addressing a lot of these other aspects. Yeah, I think one of our, the dean of our medical school at Stanford Medicine had said, I think during a medical school graduation, that the greatest discoveries are discovered in between, in this intersection between fields. And sometimes I think we forget that yeah. the body is related and, you know, organs um, are not just isolated and right. they're working in a whole system. Yeah. So, you know, if your city is, uh, you know, running and it's not if if there's a issue in the power grid and you're not having enough power and the lights flickering somewhere there's there's something that's wrong and it even though it's working it's not working optimally and right. so medwalk psychiatry takes different fields of endocrinology immunology and so forth and we really wanted to have at Stanford, we wanted to put a name to it so that more uh, clinicians and researchers and, you know, people out there do more work in this area. Yeah. Um, it really gives us a communication tool and map to be able to label something and, and to be able to work in a more collaborative way. And and the truth is, you know, for the serious mental illnesses that you're talking about, I mean, there are people suffer from anxiety, depression, major depression, more serious psychiatric illnesses from that spectrum. But then there's things like schizophrenia and bipolar disease, which are pretty intractable and mm -hmm. chronic, and the medications come with a lot of downside effects and obesity, and it kind of makes it even worse. We're seeing, you know, studies that show in the work, some of the work you've done that you see profound changes in these untreatable mental illnesses uh, when using this approach of metabolic psychiatry and nutrition and food. Is Can you kind of talk about how, how, how did you, because you, you, you kind of came from the field of obesity medicine and also psychiatric medicine. So mm -hmm. was that what kind of got you thinking about this? Or Yeah, so for me, uh, I think I was one of those really lucky at an early point in my career when I was in medical school. I had exposure to nutrition um, which usually is not typical. Mm -hmm. I think normally it's maybe two days of lectures of nutrition in medical school, You're although lucky. I'm optimistic is changing. I had an opportunity to really delve more into obesity medicine uh, starting in medical school, and that got me very interested in nutrition as well because I started seeing differences um, in in patients when it came to psychiatric symptoms. And uh, one patient in particular who had schizophrenia and treatment resistance schizophrenia, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to these patients in an obesity clinic. From there, I learned more about obesity treatments. And so I really just follow my heart. Um, in a lot of ways, I, I didn't have plans to be a physician scientist or an entrepreneur. I just had plans to treat patients. And I, I did that. And I really enjoy it. But I felt that a lot of times these things were not being treated, whether it was uh, metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance or uh, uh, met metabolic issues. And I thought it would be, you know, helpful to, to do that. And so I started really with a, a strong interest, and that just led me with my curiosity to go further into obesity medicine. I knew I wanted to do psychiatry, and I went into psychiatry with an interest in metabolism. Mm -hmm. So I veered towards obesity medicine because that was what I, I had a great mentor. Uh, in medical school, and I went in that direction. He was an obesity medicine specialist. And mm. from there, that's how I learned about ketogenic therapies uh, for seizures. And then I worked with some of the folks uh, or neurologists who do that for epilepsy and then understood how I could adapt it for psychiatric conditions. And then I started studying that. I sent it with my patients. I started studying it. And here I am many years later doing research trials. And I, and I started the a program at Stanford, which is focused on metabolism-based interventions for uh, those with bipolar or schizophrenia or depression and also eating disorders. I had yeah. done some work in eating disorders and trials and with obesity drugs. And I uh, have realized over time that there are other options and tools, which I do believe is important to integrate into psychiatry. Um, I, I felt that it was missing, that we oftentimes kind of segregate ourselves a little too much from other fields. And there's yeah. just, there's so much connection and relationship. Uh, and I'll give you one example. Yeah. Um, so in primary care, I, I saw a lot of patients that had diabetes, right? Diabetes or hypertension. But the folks that had the more severe depression tended to have insulin resistance or they had some other metabolic condition. Um, and so in primary care, the folks with diabetes 
who weren't doing well had depression. Yeah. So that's that's the the thing that I saw, and then I just got more curious um, about this and that than that connection. Yeah, there's a big yeah. crossover. Like what, forty percent of people with with um, diabetes have mental illness, right? It's pretty yeah. high. Yeah. Um, so in bipolar illness, about uh, thirty seven, almost forty percent have metabolic syndrome. Pre diabetes, essentially, yeah. Full blown metabolic syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you have insulin resistance, there one in three people have insulin resistance in the United States, and that doubles your risk of developing depression, even if you have had no psychiatric history. So there's a lot of relationships, and it depends on how you define pre diabetes too. Because I think if you look at some of the work out of Tufts, they looked at people with um, what they. So determine was metabolic dysfunction, which is either mm-hmm. you're you have a high blood sugar, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, you're overweight or obese, or you've had a heart attack or stroke. And mm-hmm. if you combine all those, which are all related to the fundamental biology of insulin resistance, which I want to unpack with you, mm-hmm. that's ninety three point two percent of Americans. So it's it's more than one in three that have some degree of this. That's concerning to me because our diet is so bad; it's so high in sugar and starch. It's such a destructive force for not only our body, but also our brain. And people don't understand that. People don't understand that, yeah, okay, I guess if I eat too many cookies or have too much soda, I'll gain weight and I'll get overweight. But they don't connect the dots with mental health. And I Mm -hmm. think, and then it becomes a vicious cycle. The more depressed you are, the less like you are to take care of yourself and you spiral. And that's what happens a lot in these patients. So can you talk about like, the, the 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 dive into this whole phenomenon of insulin resistance in the brain and how it, it affects you and, and how it's somehow different than in peripheral insulin resistance. Uh, could you talk about like cerebral hypometabolism, which means low metabolism in the brain, uh, right? And how it affects the brain and how insulin resistance plays a role in this. Can sort of unpack that. So cerebral glucose hypometabolism um, in the brain globally is a central pathological characteristic of neurodegenerative conditions and uh, also present in uh, schizophrenia and bipolar in particular. Um, And that's really when the certain areas of the brain cannot use glucose for energy. Uh, Even though glucose is present, it can't process the glucose uh, well. And you develop insulin resistance as well. And when you have insulin resistance centrally, there's a problem with insulin signaling and glucose signaling in the brain. And we see this even before the diagnosis of psychosis. Before medications are given and before the diagnosis, it's present. So we think there's a relationship between uh, psychiatric illness and insulin and glucose handling in the brain. When you have insulin resistance, in the brain, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have insulin resistance in the body. You know, measures of that uh, differ. And a lot of the medications uh, that, that we tend to use in psychiatry, unfortunately, some of them do have effects on insulin resistance peripherally, which is different than uh, insulin resistance centrally. It yeah. can affect the hypothalamus, the nuclei in the hypothalamus. It, it can increase food intake. Um, so it makes you, it increases your appetite. Hungrier. Yeah, it makes you hungrier. And with the uh, peripherally, um, it can increase insulin so that you are releasing more insulin and become insulin resistant by nature of the medication. But there's also um, elements of the medication that occur in the brain as well where it improves insulin signaling depending on the drug. So it's actually kind of complicated. And I'll give you an example is lithium. It also improves insulin signaling in the brain. But to get back to, you know, this insulin resistance concept in the brain and why it's important, it's really important because it's important for neuronal plasticity, uh, neuron, uh, neuronal growth, remodeling, shaping. It's extreme. Insulin signaling is critical for that. It's one of the reasons why it's important. When you have insulin resistance peripherally, um, so outside the brain, um, it leads to degeneration and atrophy of some of the hippocampal neurons uh, as well. And so it's structurally altering the brain when you have insulin resistance peripherally. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the insulin resistance centrally is doing that. It's the peripheral insulin resistance that's leading to that. So there is this bidirectional relationship that you mentioned earlier. 
in that bidirectional relationship is that, you know, on one side, you have, if you have type 2 diabetes or obesity or insulin resistance, it's leading to symptoms, psychiatric symptoms. It leads to a psychiatric diagnosis eventually. It's affecting the brain. But then there's also intrinsic metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance is part of that in psychiatric disease that then leads to HPA access dysregulation or it leads to um, sleep disturbances, and it leads to the obvious peripheral signs of uh, metabolic dysfunction as well. So if you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.